friend. To the how-to heretic. I'm Uncle Mark. I'm Uncle Dan. I'm Uncle Doug. And this is your user's guide to life on the outside. That's true. Leaving religion is the first step into a larger, better world. But it can also be a scary world. Things work differently now. Never fear. That's why we're here. We're your audio uncles. And with help from good friends and experts in all sorts of fields, we're going to share the stories and seek the knowledge to build a great life. After all, you only get one that we know of, so you better make the most of it. Dudes! Hello. Hey, what's up? Hello. <laughs> I hate that word. Actually, I never use the word "dude." Really, dude? It's it's a great word. Yeah, there, there's a new Is Bill it? and Ted coming out probably. So that's true. I yeah. saw that. So, yeah. so the word "dude" it's coming back hard. Alex Winter has an age of day. Looks, yeah, Keanu's definitely held up the bargain on that one. Yeah, he's got good genes. So uh, we got a show. It's going to be great. Yeah, that's what we do. Yeah, it'd be weird for us to like put out a thing that was like. We don't have a show. Yeah, and then it's just, you know, maybe you guys would like that. Maybe just an hour of dead air. Sh- of, show well, we, we, we could do, like, yeah, exactly. The, the Shofar white noise. Uh, so <laughs> I can fall asleep to Shofars every night. <laughs> the wonderful world of Shofar, brought to you by the How To Heretic <laughs> and Dr. And Pepper. Dr. Pepper. <laughs> um, so, speaking of Shofars, I'm going to, today I'm going to talk about a messianic misfire. Shofar yeah. so good. Yes, and then, and then we have a very special guest. Yes, we do. Uh, we're bringing on Daryl Ray, uh, founder of some very important uh, and 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 useful organizations, and and a very funny man, delightful human, and uh, yeah. And he's kind of a masturbation elf. He's all the good things. Well, yes, <laughs> we we are going to keep him from talking about masturbation this time. I don't think we'll be able to do it the next time we have him on. That's right. I think we will have to get. Deep down and dirty with uh, masturbation next time he comes on. All right. Well, with that, let us uh, do a show. Woo-hoo! Yes. Uncle Dan. Uh, what? I think, uh, I, I, I think I'm bored of you people and I'd like to meet some new friends. Well, you know, A, hurtful, <laughs> and B, I understand. And, uh, and let's see uh, if we can find somebody. Uh, Uncle Mark. Do you, do you have anybody fun that you could introduce us do, to? Do you guys want to make a new friend? Sure. Oh, well, okay. Well, uh, let's see. Let me just pull one out of the old brain box here. Ah, here's a friend. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to somebody very special today. Hooray. Well, he was very special until he wasn't special at all. Oh, no. <laughs> so uh, this, is, this, is a fun, this is a fun story. <clears throat> so today, co-uncles, I want to talk about the folly of pursuing greatness at all costs, of reaching perhaps too far. <laughs> Flying Icarus-like, too close to the sun, oh. and what it is to have nearly reached the heavens only to fall. Oh, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. <laughs> so today, dear uncles, I want to talk about Shabbatai's V. Now, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's not a thing uh, now that you, you just said. <laughs> you and our listeners are wondering why. Why, Uncle Mark, are we talking about the meteoric rise of Adolfo Guterres Quinones, a.k.a. Shabadoo, founder of the original Lockers, and the inventor of breakdancing's iconic locking style and the breakdancing superstar of 1984's Breakin' and Breakin' 2, oh, Electric Boogaloo. Yes, I, I have boogalooed right along with him. Okay, that guy. Uh, no. No, friends, I'm not talking oh. <laughs> about the celebrity choreographer of Madonna's 1987 Who's That Girl Tour. Damn it. Today I'm talking about one of history's niftiest near-miss messiahs, the pride of Ottoman Smyrna, Shabbatai's V. I, I want to go back to the break dancer. Yeah, me too. Uh, so that's right, guys. He may not have been one of the fathers of hip-hop dance, but Shabadai was no stranger to the quest for fame and fortune. Shabadai was born in Smyrna, as I mentioned, uh, then part of the Ottoman Empire, in the uh, wonderful year of 1626. Good year. On a Jewish holiday called Tish B'Av, uh, which was a day of mourning and fasting and remembrance of a baker's dozen of the major calamities that have befallen the Jewish people. So <laughs> sure. the sacking of the temple and then the sacking of the temple and then the time the temple got sacked. Um, <clears throat> all of those. All those and more. Uh, and this, this quirk of his birth on that day will turn out to be just a little bit significant in this story. Also significant, his name Shabbatai means Saturn. And Jewish tra- in Jewish tradition, Saturn, the king of the planets, was significant to the coming of the Messiah. No. So Shabbatai's father. Of course. I mean, that's that's obvious. We all know this. Is, I mean, I'm, I, I hate to cover ground everybody's so familiar with. Right. But let's just do it. 
so Shabbatai's father, Mordecai, sold chickens and, <laughs> and eventually became the local agent of an English trading company. Uh, and his exposure to some prevailing English millenarian ideas may also have played a part in this bizarre tale. So Mordecai sent young Shabbatai to yeshiva to study the Talmud. Nailed all of that, didn't I? Yes. That Hebrew. Uh, but he soon became more interested in the Jewish mysticism of the Kabbalah. Uh, and the talk of miracles and wonders that its practitioners claim to be able to achieve. Yeah, it's more fancy. A Kabbalah's, I think Kabbalah is more fun. It is. It's yeah. it's it's the it's the uh, it's, it's the substitute it's, teacher of of Jewish uh, it, yeah text. It's, it's also uh, the second tie into Madonna in this in this uh, bit. Right? It yeah. won't be the last. <clears throat> now, the mid seventeenth century was like so many periods. Not a very good time for the Jews. Aww. So most terribly in sixteen forty eight, some shitbag named. Bogdan Chimliki led a bunch of Cossacks uh, that murdered 100,000 Jews in the Ukraine, God damn. Uh, which was like a third or something of, or a quarter of European Jewry. So persecution was common elsewhere as well. And one can hardly blame the Jews of Europe and the Levant for feeling desperate for a little divine intervention. Sure. We all want that. So recall that Shab- Shabbatai's dad, Mordecai, uh, was in contact with English millenarians when he wasn't selling chickens. Um, And they were getting all ginned up about the upcoming year of 1666 and the end times it heralded. uh, And part of that was the Jews returning to Israel. Add to that an interpretation in the Zohar, which is a part of the Kabbalah, that said in 1648, uh, that would be the year of Israel's redemption and the appearance of their long-awaited Messiah. Taken all all together, what was the 22-year-old lad born on a holy day, named after the king of planets to do, but answers, answer history's call <laughs> and proclaim that he, Shabbatai, son of Mordecai, the chicken guy, was the Messiah that everyone had been yearning for all these years. So, in his hometown of Smyrna, he declared himself the Messiah. It didn't really set the world on fire, but it did get him noticed by local rabbis who found his outrageous claim and his provocative blasphemies, such as saying the Tetragrammaton, the forbidden sacred name of God, which we'll just go ahead and say here is Yahweh, just a bit too much. He actually was 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 purposefully performing these uh, blasphemies to show that he had come to change the rules, essentially, right? Mm. So Shabbatai bounced uh, around all over the place for some time, Constantinople, Constantinople Jerusalem, Cairo, selling his messianic uh, wares wherever he went and essentially getting excommunicated and banished by the Jewish elders at every stop. Not even his claims of being able to fly, saying it was too holy an act to share with the rabble, gained him much (laughs) traction. Yes, he claimed he could fly. So, not much traction, but The thing about a claim that you can fly is that people will ask you. That's one of the few claims where it's like, hey, that's provable. Go! Well, I would, but we're inside. Right. Right. Sorry. Oh, it's Thursday. That's just <laughs> yes. not going to work. That is not a unique claim to our friend Shabbatai here. No. Uh, the ding, ding dong from the Elm Shinrikyo cult claimed he could well. fly. Uh, the guy from um, Falun Gong said he could levitate and that he'd known too many people that knew how to I levitate. I remember that, yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's just one of those things where it's like you back yourself in, you paint yourself into a rough corner yeah. when you claim you can fly. That's exactly right. So he didn't get a lot of traction from that, but he got some. So even though the authorities were having none of it, his traveling show lit a small fire among the workaday Jews of the time, and the whispers of his divinity began to grow to at least kind of an indoor voice. (laughs) So uh, his minor fame was boosted tremendously by his chance meeting with a man of similarly humble self-regard, a guy who called himself simply Nathan the Prophet, Mm. uh, who, by the way, would later declare himself the reincarnation of the prophet Elijah when this shit got out of hand, so... Nice. Very, very like humble it. fellows. But a good hype man. Great. He was a very good hype man. He was also a man of great learning and an ascetic of the, of the Kabbalah of the highest order. Mm. So Nathan confirmed that Shabbatai was indeed the long-awaited Messiah and reignited Shabbatai's passion for seeing this crazy thing through to the end, no matter what. So Nathan went on to predict that uh, he would marry, that Shabbatai would marry Rebecca, the daughter of the resurrected Moses, he would gather the, sac- the scattered tribes of Israel, <laughs> and he would seize the crown from the Ottoman sultan's head. Now, 
put a pin in that. Ooh. We're going to come back to that. Yeah, that's a rough one. <laughs> you, so, if, if he had stopped right before that one, he probably would have been in okay. Uh, some of history's great moments you don't realize are happening as they happen, right? <laughs> um, so it mattered not that Shabbatai was already married to Sarah, quite a colorful character in her own right. She was a Jewish girl orphaned in a massacre in Poland, then raised to be a nun in a convent for several years until her escape to an Italian port city where she worked as a sex worker uh, for years and years before having visions she was to marry the Messiah. Shabbatai somehow heard about this Ah! and had her brought to Cairo (laughs) and sure enough married her. Quirky as that seems, it actually helped foster the notion of his messiahship. Hell yeah. Because it was believed to reflect the story of the prophet Hosea in the Bible, who was called by God to, quote, take a wife of whoredom, unquote. (laughs) I know. This story has everything. So by this point in late 1665, uh, the Shabbatai shit was getting seriously out of control. Yeah. So by now, rather than being banished wherever he went, he was greeted like a messiah, Um, His followers had become so numerous and so vocal that the rabbi elders that once banished him were afraid to raise any objections at at all, lest they be torn apart by the mob. Um, So word of the Messiah traveled through the increasingly connected world to the point where there was hardly a corner of Europe, Asia Minor, North Africa that had not heard of the miraculous tale of Shabbatai and his powers. In some cities, Jews pulled the roofs off their own houses in preparation for being translated <laughs> through the sky directly to Israel at any minute. Not trusting that their Lord and, and, and magic God could actually like get them through yes, a roof. I was going to pull you up to heaven, but the thatch was in the way. Right. So. You know what? You just you get to minimize risks. Or Yeah, well, uh, yeah. The other thing is that he might just, he not, might not be paying attention and you, and just bonk you on bonk. the head. And <laughs> your, you know, your special day is ruined. <laughs> so most synagogues hung his sacred initials on the walls and his portrait accompanied King David's in prayer books. Wow. And a standardized prayer was introduced to be prayed to him multiple times a week rather than just once on the Sabbath which was, bless our Lord and King, the righteous Shabbat Eyes V, the Messiah of the God of Jacob. So, in 1666, Shabbat I made his way to Constantinople in order to fulfill the prophecy of removing the crown from the Sultan's head. Oh, God. Oof. Whereupon, he immediately became a guest of the Sultan <laughs> in prison. <laughs> yeah. Where, oddly enough, he was well-treated. He was allowed to live with his wife. And have all the visitors he wanted. Interesting. And he had at this point he had like shit tons of money. Yeah. Like huge backers, like the kind of the biggest names, the heaviest hitters in in Jewish Europe of the time were all behind this guy, right? You gotta so. wonder if there was like a moment where he's talking to the Sultan and he just goes, Look, I know I'm not gonna try and dethrone you. I know that you you've got soldiers outside every door here. Mm. Can I take your crown off your head? Just for a minute. Can I just hold it in my hands, <laughs> maybe get my picture took with it, and then put it back on your head? Ta-da! And then, you know, then it's a win-win for everybody. Well, as we'll see, uh, uh, Shabbatai did not know that the pair of twos he was playing with was not going to beat, <laughs> beat the hand that the Sultan was holding. The royal so, flush. So <clears throat> it was here in this prison where he was lived kind of lavishly that he decided to slaughter a Passover lamb himself and eat it with its fat, which we know is a major violation of the Jewish law. And he began to declare that certain Jewish holidays of fast and mourning would now, including his own birthday, would now be feast days and celebration, further alienating whatever small part of the Jewish world wasn't buying his little act. Pardon me. By now, he had countless followers. His power as a religious figure was nearly absolute. The year of the millennium was at hand. All the planets, including his namesake Jupiter, had aligned to deliver (laughs) this great man to this great moment. Hallelujah! Now, remember when I said to put a pin in Nathan the prophet saying Shabbatai was going to take the sultan's crown? Yeah. I don't know about you guys, but I don't know a lot of sultans. The ones I do know are pretty tight with their crowns. (laughs) My sultan friends would not take overly kindly to some so-and-so from Smyrna thinking he was going to come snatch it. And so... It was that God's anointed messenger to bring about the end and the new beginning was summoned in all his majesty before the vizier of the sultan, the sultan's right-hand man. Yeah. There he stood, our Shabbatai, beloved by his people, mouthpiece for God himself and a god in his own right. And it was in this crackling, portentous silence the vizier spoke. Shabbatai, messenger of the Almighty, instrument of cosmic realignment, 
was given three choices. First, he may prove his divinity by a test via archery. <laughs> meaning <laughs> meaning like he, he would be tied to a post and archers would fire at him. Oh, shit. <laughs> nice. I, if they missed, he must be divine. See, I had this. I, I, when you said that, I, I had a very. Uh, a like very, he was going to fire something? Yeah, I, I, I had a, a, a Robin Hood sort of scenario in my uh, head. I figured he'd be on the business end of the well, arrow. Remember that uh, uh, the woman who does the Ramtha channeling? Yeah. Part of her practice is her people do blindfolded archery. <laughs> really? <laughs> It's amazing that there's anyone left. <laughs> so, so if if they missed him, he would be divine. If they hit him, well, it's a fair cop. Yeah. So, second choice, the second, he could just straight up be impaled on a pointed stick, <laughs> right there, right now. <laughs> and third, he could simply convert to Islam, denounce all of his messianic nonsense, and walk out the door a free man with a fine house, a pension, and a second wife to boot. Now. In the pregnant, static-filled air of one of history's great moments, <laughs> Shabadai puffed up his chest, stuck out his chin, looked the vizier squarely in the eye, and proclaimed, yeah, number three, let's do that. Yeah, one. I'm a Muslim now. That is awesome. <laughs> there is no God but Allah. <laughs> and so it was the very next day that the newly christened <laughs> Aziz Mehmed Effendi <laughs> <laughs> stood before the, sly, the slyly smiling sultan and removed his Jewish attire forever and donned a Turkish turban. <laughs> he sent out a simple message to his madly devoted followers around the world, saying simply, <laughs> God has made me an Ishmael, Ishmaelite. He has commanded, and it was done. <laughs> <laughs> and with that... The feverish year of 1666 ended not with a bang, but with a whimper. <laughs> and the formerly anointed Messiah spent the rest of his life puttering around the house as a low-level Ottoman nobleman. <laughs> and so, so oddly enough, some of his followers converted with him, uh, I guess thinking it was part of some grand scheme. Right, yeah. Like, oh, we're going to pretend. And, <laughs> and, they may, and some of them maintained into the, into the 20th century. No kidding. Oddly, it's a very, very small number wow. maintained. But mostly it just... It just sputtered. I, and they, I think they also thought that, again, it was a trick rather than him just choosing a pension over a hasty impaling. But it really just sputtered out. So well, there's nothing in the Bible that says that the Messiah won't convert to Islam. I don't, I, <laughs> there's no, the, I, I think those footnotes have been lost to history. So, <laughs> so as a final note, I tried to find a, a poignant quote from Shabadoo in Breakin, the movie, to end with. But there isn't one better than girls are whack. Um, and I watched the whole movie, which I think makes me the Messiah now since I suffered so much for my people. But I own that movie. It's actually, really? I love that movie. It's Do you like, own it on, on cassette it, tape or? Uh, on, uh, no, I, I once saw it, laser in a, disc. It, I saw it in a, uh, in a discount DVD bin and was like, <laughs> yoink. I, it's, I, I watched it yesterday trying to find a quote to I put love in. That movie. And there wasn't one, but it's, it's an awesome movie. It's, really? it's horrifically bad. And wonderful. The acting is awful. It's so delightful, though. And, you know, the dance. Dancing is interesting. Yeah, Ice T makes an appearance. Yeah, and uh, and and uh, an uncredited John Claude Van Damme is in the crowd. Oh, is he? Clearly, as clear as as clear as a bell. Oh, I see. love it. I it's love like it. the eighties threw up onto a DVD. It's amazing. Right. They forgot to hire any actors, but they uh, <laughs> but they had a they had good break dancers. Yeah. Did yeah, it, and it was back when uh, people who danced like that were scary to white folk. <laughs> That's it was totally delightful. scary. Anyway, <laughs> we, I think we've gone on a tangent. We have indeed. So, uh, uh, so Allahu Akbar and <laughs> <Yes>. uh, <laughs> Inshallah, everyone. Let's, Let's move, move on. on. Oh, gentlemen. Hey, yes. We, uh, we get people excited hmm. on this show. And then we let them down. And then... <laughs> It's a set and then a splat. That's on. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so, but some people actually want to uh, to give us money so that we can keep doing this show because otherwise, what's our motivation? And I vote we take it. Okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, seconded. The motion carries. That's right. <clears throat> so we got some folks to thank, uh, and uh, and we'll do so right now. Um, thanks so much to Robin uh, and to N L. And to John the Ginger Scotsman. Mm. Uh, Our kind of guy. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Uncle Doug, you, ha you, would, you and he a, would have, I have a compatriot to talk about. That's right. Um, but we also have uh, some people 
are so saintly in their giving. They've blown right past sainthood. Yeah, they don't get a saint. They, they get to go to heaven. That's right. Uh, so this is a thing that we do when people give at a certain level, and uh, we got a couple of them. And I am going to say that we'll start with Uncle Doug, who is going to be giving a saint dedicated to the girlfriend of Jens. All right. Well, this is this is a birthday present for listener Yen's fiance, who is a, was a big listener, and we love her, and we're glad she's around. That's right, and and uh, she knows who she is. I hope so. Um, and Otherwise, he, we'll have to do this again. That's right. So, well, listener Yen's fiance, or LJF, as we'll refer to her for reasons <laughs> that will soon become clear, for your sins and for your birthday, this is your heaven. As over the course of your life, birthdays stop being joyous affairs as one passes certain milestones. And start taking on a more ominous tone as you realize that like a disabled submarine, you are simply marking the meters until you inevitably reach your whole crush depth. (laughs) But for now, rejoice in knowing that when the inky blackness has swallowed you whole, there is light at the end of the tunnel, or rather, on the far side of the bridge. LJF, when this world is done with you, another bigger, stranger world awaits. At first you are blinded by an overwhelming light and an unrecognizable thunderous cacophony. But as your eyes and ears become accustomed to your new surroundings, an incredible tableau stretches out to the horizon. You stand on the edge of a vast canyon, whose far side is beyond your vision. In front of you, a thin, crystalline bridge stretches toward the horizon. The bridge appears to be made of large glass tiles, each one emblazoned with shining letters. You focus on the first one until it becomes legible. OT1. The second says, OT2, and on and on, seemingly forever. On both sides of the bridge are enormous stadium stands, also stretching to the distance, filled with incredibly strange and colorful beings, more numerous than the sands of the sea, all cheering for you and chanting your name. Off in the distance, giant volcanoes belch clouds of yellow, red, and black into the sky, lit by two shimmering binary stars. Great airships patrol the distance. Although from here they look like 70s-era mid-range passenger jets with papier-mâché missiles taped to the wings, <laughs> but that would be stupid. It takes you a minute, but then it hits you like a volleyball spiked by a shirtless Tom Cruise. You are in Scientology heaven. <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> oh, no! You are overcome with the feeling that you are to move along the bridge in front of you. But wait, you say to yourself. I've done plenty of auditing. I've given a fair share of my money. Shouldn't I start from where I got to in my earthly life? Oh, you silly LJF. Were it so easy, everyone would do it. It turns out that in, that in death, Scientologists reset like Mario at the beginning of a level. Oh. Well, you think at least I know what to do, and you begin searching for your, for your checkbook. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly a flaming sword appears in front of you. It is Excalibur. And in a voice you hear in your mind, and in a language you do not speak yet understand, you are told that here in Scientology heaven, your path has been prepaid. Oh. Ooh. Step forward. That my, is heaven. I know, right? Step forward, my child, says the voice. You stretch out your foot and take one large step onto the bridge. The crowd goes wild, screaming your name in ecstasy. As you look down at your feet, you see the canyon below has no bottom but stretches forever. Momentarily momentarily stricken by vertigo, you sway to and fro, waving your arms to correct yourself. The crowd gasps. Steady, my child, says the voice from the sword that takes up a a position next to you. You take another step. Again, the crowd explodes. Well done, my child, says the voice. Your confidence building, you take a step onto the O3, OT3 tile. Ooh. And just as you do, something triggers in your memory. Something about OT3. The crowd goes silent, and Excalibur slowly moves away as it repeats over and over. The fire is lit. The fire is lit. <laughs> Suddenly below you, a hot wind rises from the chasm, followed by a growing yellow light. Well, shit, you think. But wait! As the wall of fire rises up to consume you, you are overcome with an incredible feeling of peace and wonder. The flames don't burn at all. But instead, your mind is opened, and it all makes sense. A prolific pulp fiction science writer creating a science fiction religion? Sure. Galactic empires, giant movie theaters, vacuum ships, John Travolta's career, being a total dick to your family? It all makes sense. It's all true. And with that, the fire subsides. The crowd, who you now realize are pre-Zenu aliens, goes wild, and Excalibur says, Well done, my child. You look at the bridge and are filled with a sense of urgency. You want nothing more than to get across the bridge to the far end to those waiting out there. So another step you take, another cheer from the crowd. Well done, my child. Another step, another cheer. Well done, my child. This goes on for a while. Chip, steer, well done, my child. Step, cheer, well done, my child. Ugh, you think. Do these aliens ever get bored? Does Excalibur have nothing better to do? Step, cheer, well done, my child. You look at the tile below your feet. 
O T X X L M C V L M M V I I. You take a deep breath and uh, you take a deep breath. Step. Cheer. Well done, my child. Finally, after what seemed like an eternity and quite literally was, you see something in the distance. You squint to make it out, and it appears to be an ornate, gaudy stage, surrounded by the flags of all the universe's nations, a lot of gold leaf, and two large pictures of a paunchy middle-aged man with really bad teeth and an ill-fitting knockoff Navy uniform. <laughs> Another few steps, and you realize it's LRH. The fact that Scientology in, in Scientology heaven, they couldn't shave off a few pounds or give him proper ortho- orthodontia does not bother you at all. <laughs> you pick up your pace. Step, cheer, well done, my child. Step, cheer, well done, my child. As you get closer, more details are visible to you. Many prominent Scientologists mill about the stage. A group on the right is engaged in a spirited a cappella rendition of We Stand Tall. On the right side, there's a hot tub where, where a shirtless Tom Cruise and David Miscavige sit, very close together, with only one hand visible, making intense eye contact. <laughs> John Travolta is, is n- nothing but a towel, sits nearby, impatiently waiting his turn. The center of the stage is raised on a dais, on top of which there is a golden table with an E-meter seemingly made of light. On one side sits LRH himself. On the other, a being you've never seen before but instantly recognize as Lord Xenu. Mm. You're not shocked. You get it. As you sprint towards the end of the bridge, it all falls into place. LRH and Xenu are two sides of the same being, the light and the dark. It is one eternal round. Time is a flat circle. You're so dizzy (laughs) from enlightenment, enlightenment that you fail to notice that whatever Tom and David are doing has reached some sort of a crescendo, spilling hot tub water on the last few tiles. You hear the crowd gasp before you even realize that you've slipped. Your body slams hard on the last tile. You hear a loud crack, and everything, the crowd, Excalibur, the stage, the hot tub, all disappear into silent blackness. At first you are blinded by an overwhelming white light and an unrecognizable thunderous cacophony. But as your eyes and ears become accustomed to the new surroundings, an incredible tableau stretches out to the horizon. This is your heaven, LJF. Do enjoy. Oh, <laughs> ouch. Oh, boy. Uh, happy birthday. Yeah, happy that's, birthday. Uh, that's great. Welcome. Who doesn't want to go to Scientology heaven? <laughs> wow. It sounds really super duper. So uh, I believe. And clear. It all feels very clear. <laughs> I believe we have another. Oh, yes, indeed. Uh, Uncle Mark, you, your job is to heavenize Michael. Michael. Both we and your Heavenly Father thank you for your kind patronage. (laughs) So we hope you won't mind a little forever misfire with your final eternal destination. I know it's a little confusing. Let me explain. Michael, the heaven you are now inextricably bound for on a day far distant is not the originally designed heaven for you. I'm sad to report, but it's, it's a fine heaven anyway. Even the creator of the universe and everything in it forgets to, you know, dot an I or cross a T now and then. For example, Ted Cruz. Ted Cruz exists. So uh, you see, it's like the, the inciting moment in Terry Gilliam's Brazil, Heaven's Telex machine sometimes has a bug fall in it, changing Tuttle to Buttle, and things get a little fucky. So <laughs> <laughs> never mind all that unpleasantness, Michael, for you are indeed going to a heaven, and that heaven is the malt shop. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Michael, you will spend your infinite billions upon trillions of years in a slice of Americana, not only frozen in time, but also serving frozen delights all the time. The malt shop is an eternal Saturday evening in the Grand Rapids, Michigan of 1955. <laughs> As you remove the coins from your eyes that were supposed to pay your passage to the afterlife, you're going to see that they're nickels, ideal for the glowing jukebox in the corner, Woo. around which dance a small group of impossibly cute Clean-cut teens in poodle skirts, saddle shoes, varsity jackets, and crew cuts. Behind a long counter, a couple of tall soda jerks scurry about, scooping cones and blending triple thicks for all the beaming kids. It's not really your speed, sure, but the youthful, uncomplicated vibe of the place, it's, not, it's, it's hard not to love. It's as if Norman Rockwell ejaculated this reality into existence at the peak moment of his Norman Rockwellness. So... <laughs> As you take it all in, you do notice it's a bit uh, white. Yeah, I was going to say, I hope you're not black, Michael. <laughs> As in the people. And it's 100% heteronormative. And I would just ask, Michael, what part of Grand Rapids 1955 do you not understand? <laughs> right. <laughs> so finding your feet, you mosey over to the counter to order what will be the first of an infinite number of milkshakes. As you slide onto the gleaming chrome stool, you notice all the kids giving you a bit of a look. As the soda jerk leans, leans in with a welcoming wink, he hesitates for just a beat as he asks what you'll have. 
he gets a little caught up somewhere between sir and a sudden ma'am. Oh. Let me explain. When the bug fell in the celestial telex machine, it goofed your salvation destination, but just by a couple letters. You see, the malt shop was designed for your great your great aunt Michelle, not you, Michael. <laughs> her greatest moment in life was her first date with Jake Masterson at the corporeal version of this very malt shop on a summer Saturday in 1955, and a loving God prepared her paradise accordingly. <laughs> oh, dear. So in addition to the clerical error placing you in your dearly departed relatives hereafter, you have also been requisitioned her, her, her eternal wardrobe, etc., and despite the soda jerk's rude fumble, I think you're a vision in that smart pink poodle skirt and powder blue cashmere cardigan. Do they fit? Absolutely not. Do they fit in in this temple of post-war Caucasian American conformity? You betcha. <laughs> <laughs> now, I know this feels very awkward and your feet are jammed into cute Mary Janes, five sizes too small. But have you heard what happened to your Auntie Michelle? Oh my God, it's way worse. <laughs> she got shunted to some German S and M guy's afterlife called Himmel des Endlosen Zorns, the Heaven of Endless Wrath, which is an eternal Rammstein concert in an endless rain in a muddy field outside of Dusseldorf, where poor Auntie Michelle has spent the last decade and a half of her afterlife trying very much to speak to someone in charge. <laughs> and as to that, in the celestial bureaucracy, there is no system of appeals or any sort of complaint department, because by design, things can't ever go wrong in a perfect system. Even when they do, which they don't, despite you and your kindly auntie's current co-predicament. See? It's almost too simple. <laughs> hey, at least you're inside and there's ice cream, and that dreamboat Jake Masterson is there. Hubba hubba. <laughs> and just so you get the lay of the sweet-smelling patch of land you've arrived at, your nickels will never run out, so you and your, the rest of your neato gang can play records without so much as a pause. However, you should know that there are five and only five singles on the jukebox. <coughs> Firstly, Bill Haley and the Comets rock around the clock. That's can't, always... Can't that's, go wrong. That's a crowd pleaser, <laughs> right? Next, the Cordette's poppy love ballad, Mr. Sandman. Oh. Who doesn't love that? Yeah. Third, Les Baxter's Unchained Melody, a real fave for a slow dance with your fella. Just a note, this is the heaven of a chaste 15-year-old Lutheran girl born in 1950, uh, 1940 in rural Michigan. So Jake Masterson might be good for a dance, a brief hug, or an innocent peck, but you're never going to get his dick. Still, it's a great song. <laughs> Fourth, Bill Hayes, The Ballad of Davy Crockett. Kind of a slow, weird story song, but believe me, you're going to need some relief from the other four songs. And lastly, Tennessee Ernie Ford's 16 Tons. Also a story song, but at least this one's got some groove and a sexy bat beat. For all the sexy times, none of you are ever going to get. <laughs> now, as far as the ice cream, it's the fucking best. The banana splits, the sundaes, the shakes. These soda jerks are without equal in the known universe. But watch your step, young Missy. There are three ice cream flavors in this endless 1955. Vanilla, strawberry, and chocolate. But mostly vanilla. Careful you don't ask for anything too queer. <laughs> so, dear Michael, or maybe Michelle, just own it. There's no other choice. You got a little music, you got a boyfriend, and you got one-third of a rainbow of flavors forever. Your poor Auntie Michelle only has ear-splitting rage metal, ketamine, and writhing muddy fuck piles of German nihilists in the freezing rain forever. And prior to that, she'd never even been to St. Paul for the Harvest Festival. So, as always, count your many blessings, Michael, in your candy-colored heaven from which there is no escape and no respite. Whew. Wow. Well. Enjoy that. With those two heavens uh, to look forward to, how could anyone not be giving to us at yes. these levels? <laughs> Who wouldn't want that? Who? Why? Why are? Why isn't everybody a ten dollar patron? I don't know. Well, uh, uh, congratulations, everyone! Yes. And uh, with that, let's move on. M moving on. Uncle Doug, Uncle Mark, <clears throat> what is your favorite uh, salt and pepper song? Um, it's going to be Push It. It's going to be Push It. <laughs> I, don't I think, ask for a second. I think <laughs> Uncle Dan's favorite, and I've, I've seen him kind of mimicking the choreography in his studio in front of the mirror many times. You saw that? Yeah. yeah oh, yeah, yeah. How'd I look? A, you looked fantastic. Thank you. I think, I, I, based on his choreography, I think his favorite is Let's Talk About Sex, Baby. Yes, indeed. Uh, yeah. I do love that one. Uh, but I don't love that one as much as... Uh, my friend Daryl Ray, who I'm, I'm, bringing, I'm bringing him into the conversation, 
our salt and pepper breakdown. Uh, yeah. so, yes, exactly. So, uh, Daryl, welcome to the apparently music appreciation. A 90s hip hop, go. A 90s hip hop. Okay. Uh, uh, right. All right. Well, I can talk about that. <laughs> uh, Daryl, you are, uh, just so that our listeners know, you are uh, a man of many skills, talents, and uh, and you're a busy, busy bee, aren't you? I try to be. Uh, I figure until I die, I might as well stay busy. Yes, indeed. So, uh, so among your many accomplishments, one of the ones that uh, there are a few things that I wanted to talk to you about. Um, your organiz- an organization that that you that you helped found called Recovering from Religion, I believe, is about to celebrate its or, or is celebrating its tenth anniversary. Is that right? Actually, next month is our 10th anniversary, but you have just already disappointed me, Dan. I hope we were going to talk about masturbation, but okay, if you want to talk about recovering from religion, I can do that too. Well, we'll you yeah, know what? Yeah. We'll, do, we'll get to masturbation also. Well, That's... the two subjects are not unrelated. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Why don't we finish with masturbation? <laughs> well, yeah, it does seem like usually we do that at the end so yeah. because we all get oh, well, sleepy yeah. afterwards. <laughs> yes, we. Uh, it was literally 10 years ago. Next month that I, uh, I did a, a – I called a meeting at an IHOP, the back uh, room of an IHOP and uh, on Meetup and said, anybody who wants to come and talk about how religion helped hurt you and how you benefited from leaving, 11 people showed up. And uh, three hours later, the restaurant manager was kicking us out because they were closing the restaurant. <laughs> and I realized at that moment that I had a tiger by the tail, that people needed to tell their story. People needed help in dealing with the recovering from their religious trauma and upbringing and indoctrination. And I started it literally that night. I came back and started figuring out how do we, how do we put this all together? And it started off slowly. It took me a year or two before we did everything we needed to and got incorporated and all that sort of stuff. But we've been running hot and heavy now for, for uh, 10 years. And tell us, what, so what, is, what does the organization do? What, what is, what's the mission and, and how do you enact that mission? Well, our unof- we have we have an unofficial way of saying that we are – lots of organizations will help you get into religion. We are the only one who will help you get out of religion. <laughs> <laughs> That's our unofficial motto. Right. <laughs> uh, our official motto is no one should do the journey alone. Mm-hmm. And that's mm-hmm. what people feel so much when they leave a religion is they lose their community. They may lose their family. They may lose all their friends. You know, just that kind of stuff just – really creates all sorts of havoc in in people's lives and we want to help people find new new community and and uh, connect with their values so that they can they can live the life they want to live not the life some uh elder or priest or or god wants them to to live right so, and that was that was our initial you know from the very beginning I, i'm a psychologist by training and i've found that there's a lot of – my friend Marlene Winnell, Dr. Marlene Winnell, has come up with the concept of religious trauma syndrome. Right. And what we have found is Marlene hit a gold mine there and a kind of a negative gold mine. <laughs> it's by identifying the worst that. kind of gold you can find. It's a shit mine. I, I don't, I, yeah, I don't want that kind of gold. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, this is – it's we just see it everywhere. We see the trauma that people experience. I mean, we see it especially in the more cult-like religions, which means Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses, mm-hmm. Pentecostals, and that sort of stuff. Right. And the ones, so the ones really, that are very controlling of of how their membership uh, acts and and yes. and very uh, very intimately involved in their personal their lives. daily lives and and behaviors. Yep. Yeah. And uh, in fact, we can talk about this later, but I've, I've done a lot of research in this area, and we're currently in the middle of finishing some research in this area. And uh, what we found it, pretty much in our research is the more a religion tries to control your sexuality, the more cult-like that religion is. And what I've found is that people aren't talking to – people are debate what's a cult, what's not a cult. And in our research, you can almost draw – you can draw a pretty clear line down, down the graph if you want. Those religions that try to get in the bedroom and really control what you're doing, those are all, always cults. Huh. And that's, that's we found in our religion, um, in our in our own research. And I mean, this is scientific research; it's not just Daryl's anecdotes. <laughs> uh, well, we published we published our first research back in 2012. It's available online. We're about ready to finish a second round of that same research with hmm. 
uh, some better stuff. Four, over 4,000 people participated in this, wow. in this research. So. What religions fall on the far side of not controlling your sexuality? A Unitarian. <laughs> Unitarian. <laughs> That's it. Uh, that was just, an easy just, answer. Just them. Well, yeah. well, the Wicca and the pagans, none of them, they don't give a shit. Well, yeah. actually, they do give a shit. They want, they want to have sex. And right. They're very, right. I think There's the Pastafarians are pretty cool that way, but uh, yeah, Unitarians yeah. and them. Yeah, and your listeners may not realize that you're talking who you're talking to right now. Um, you don't, they don't know that, do they, Dan? That I am the high priest of the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster. You are indeed. You are. Oh. You are a a, a big wig. In, I'm in, higher than the Pope himself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm guessing you're usually higher than the Pope, but that's just a guess. I don't know that for sure. <laughs> yeah, well, we won't go there this this time. Maybe another time. We can talk yeah, yeah. Well, the Pope only has one lung, so I think it's a little harder yeah. for him to to get the proper dosage. Yeah, probably. <laughs> so, so tell me what. Uh, so, uh, let's just say that I am, uh, as many of our listeners are, a newly new someone who's who's starting to to take the first tentative steps uh, out of religion. What what would uh, recovering from religion provide for them what 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 could they what could they hope to get from yeah. rfr well, we, over the years we've developed a number of programs that are that we provide and supply to our clients we we call them clients anybody that calls in is our client and everything we offer is free we don't charge a dime we are totally dependent upon donations from good people who want to help us with our mission and uh, the first thing is we have uh, small groups that meet face-to-face in, in cities around the United States. And we've had small groups in far away as Malta and London. Wow. Um, most of our groups are here in North America. Not that we wouldn't want them everywhere. We just it's hard, to, it's hard to maintain all that. Right. But anyways, that's our, that was the way the whole thing began. But <clears throat> about six years ago, we started. Four or five, um, five or six years ago, I can't remember when exactly, we started the Hotline Project in which pay, in which people can phone in or they can chat in. And we have uh, volunteers that will take chats or, t- or take calls. And so if you're – we, I would say on average, gosh, I don't know, two to five times a day, somebody chats in and says, I just became an atheist. What do I do next? Mm. I mean, literally, that's that's where they're at. I just figured all this out's a lie, and I and I don't know where to go from now. Right. And we could get an ex we could get an ex Buddhist, we could get an ex Mormon, we could get an ex Baptist, we could get an ex Hindu, we could get an ex Muslim. We can get them all in the same day. Right. And we can get them, we can get them from Pakistan, Mexico. I mean, as long as they can speak English, we'll work with them. Wow. We, we have a Spanish piece, but it's not very active, and we'd like to. Sp- Spend in other languages, but right now we're just pretty much English based. So, so that's the main thing. And then behind that, we have communities that we can invite people to, so that you're an ex-Mormon and you you chat in with us. Say, I don't know, nobody else in my community, everybody else is religious, and I, I don't know what to do. I want to talk to somebody, and what we can do is chat with you a little bit and find out. Oh, you're an ex-Mormon, and then we can invite you to what we call a channel. We would invite you to the ex-Mormon channel. Hmm. Uh, and you can join some other channels like the X Christian channel or the X whatever channel. If you're in the military, we have a military. If you're LGBTQ, we can invite you to that. You can belong to multiple channels. And then inside those channels, you can talk to other people just like you that are leaving Mormonism and are dealing with the issues that, you know, they were taught they couldn't masturbate uh, by the Packer memo that came out in 1962. We're familiar. <laughs> we, we, we we're yes uh, we're uh, intimately familiar yeah. with, with our little factories. I came yeah. on it once. First, first time I saw don't tamper with the factory. I lost it. I couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> the little factory. It, it's <laughs> don't pretty amazing. With, yeah, it was. It was. So that's a that's a huge part of what we do. A lot of our volunteers. We have very very uh, good training people. The volunteer for us go through a. A fairly rigorous training program. We don't let anybody touch our clients unless they know what they're doing. We are not a substitute for psychotherapy. We're a we're a, more a peer support kind of a thing. Right. And but but you come people, at it from a from a a psychologically sound point of view. Absolutely, absolutely. And we train our we train our 
our, our chat line agents and very good listening skills. Your job is not to convert and your job is not to deconvert. We aren't here to, we aren't here to tell you how to live your life. And frankly, we don't care if you go back to church. It, it's up to you. It, all this is up to you. And we teach, uh, we don't teach it, but we do encourage our volunteers to use a street epistemology that, you know, Anthony Magnabosco has been um, training so many people in this. And a number of our volunteers are highly trained in street epistemology. You guys are familiar with that? Yeah. yeah. I mean, and what's nice about that is that it's not a, it's not a, a method of converting anyone to any specific way of thinking, but rather just a way of sort of in, uh, interrogating one's own thoughts and and, exactly. and uh, diving into one's own uh, way, like asking questions about your own beliefs and why yeah. you believe what you believe. Right. Uh, Dr. Peter Bogosian uh, wrote the book on that, and, and Anthony's picked up the, the baton, and he's done a real good job. And we cooperate with other groups. We cooperate with groups like his, the Street Epistemology Group, uh, we also uh, participate and cooperate with the Clergy Project. That is, a lot of people confuse us with the Clergy Project, but we're not the same. We're just we're two different organizations, but we do help those people, um, right? In a few ways. N- and then the the third, I'm sorry. No, no, Jim, go on, go on. The third big program, and this is probably one that it's something nobody nobody's ever seen before on this planet, <laughs> and that is the Secular Therapy Project. Right. Uh, uh, the Secular what I discovered it back in 2012 was it's very difficult. It is very difficult to find a secular therapist. There's a lot of Christian counselors out there. Yeah. There's a lot of religious based counseling and it's bullshit. There's a lot of counselors that have PhDs in psychology, but they got them from Pat Robertson's university. Right. <laughs> Man, what you're going to get when you go in their office or they've got crucifixes or they've got Bibles hanging uh, in their, uh, in their offices. So how do you find a therapist that's going to use evidence-based methods, and they're not going to bring religion into it? And they're not going to tell you the part of your depression is related to the fact that you become an atheist. You need to go back to church. You cannot. You would never believe how many people tell us that. I would yeah. say half the people that come to us looking for therapists say, I've been to three therapists, and they all try to send me back to church. Yeah, I literally just the other day was reading a friend's account on Facebook of somebody uh, going to therapy uh, be, for depression and having his therapist just continually tell him, well, it's because you're gay. It's because you're gay. You need to stop being gay. Have you thought about pussy? Have you thought about being, uh, yeah, this is a, being uh, with girls? Maybe this is the same friend of mine, this young guy who, who went for depression. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we're in, Daryl, we're here in Utah. We're in Mormon country. This is an incredibly yeah. common story here. Yeah. And, yeah. and so, you know, I've, I've, when I've been asked about this and I'm not a therapist or qualified, I've told people seeking therapy, just straight up ask, Yeah, you know, yeah. Are, is religion going to play into this, into our discussion? Because I can leave right now. Yeah, exactly. Well, okay. Tell that person to chat in with us or contact us. We yeah. have a list of guidelines, a very, very thorough list of guidelines. Here's the questions to ask your therapist before you start. Yeah. And that will, that will, these questions that we've outlined will establish that they're secular or they're not secular. They're not get the hell out of there. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And you it's, and, and it's important. And you don't even have to, you don't have to wait until you're in their office. You can call them up before you even, before you even you make an appointment and just say, Hey, I've got a few questions that I want to ask you before we, yeah. before we start. Exactly. Why, why so is it so important? I mean, I guess, yeah. I mean, it's so interesting because you'd think that a, you know, a Christian can provide therapy just as well as a, a non-Christian or whatever, but they, it's so crazy. They so often do not draw that line. No. And their, and their ethics say they should. And they believe, many times they believe they are doing it, but they're just fooling themselves into thinking, well, I'm not letting my religion influence me. Right. Even as we're sitting there with half a dozen Christian counseling books on, this, on their yeah. shelves in the office. Well, that's bullshit. When, when you, those books are written by people who are trying to teach therapists, so-called therapists, how to bring people back to Jesus. Mm. They're not there to help people get over their depression. Jesus caused the damn depression in the first place. Right. <laughs> the fact that Jesus said you can't masturbate for the rest of your life. You can't have sex before you're married. You, you know, you can't, you have to give 10% of your money or more before taxes. That had caused anybody to be depressed. Yeah. I'm getting depressed just talking about it. <laughs> and I never did it. <laughs> right. 
<laughs> yeah, it's it, it's a remarkable uh, thing that you guys are doing, and I think that the work is is so important, and our listeners especially are uh, could could really benefit from it. Um, and I well, think I yeah. you, you know we aim we 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 supposedly aim our show at the recently uh, released from religion, but also I mean there are plenty of veterans. Uh, could people who are listening to this become uh, uh, volunteers? Well, two things. Yeah. Oh, hell yeah. They can be – anybody can volunteer for us if they're willing to go through the training. But here's something that shocked me. The first year or so that I w- uh, we did Recovering from Religion, I found, I found so many virtually lifelong atheists that were still dealing with religious shit. Oh, yeah. I mean I know, I know an atheist who cannot – not, cannot do cunning lingus on his wife because he was taught at the age of 14 it was dirty by his great um, by his methodist very fundamentalist methodist mother wow and the guys the guys as old as i am now that's crazy you know um so so that's a lifelong atheist still right. dealing with religious bullshit and we hear a lot of that uh in in our work so many so you can use our services and say, look, I'm still dealing with some of this guilt and shame. I can't – I hate going to my family. I'm an atheist for the last 30 years, but I still have to go to Thanksgiving. What do I do? And we've got tons and tons of guidelines. We have, we have almost a – we have a massive library of resources mm. that we accumulate. We're constantly adding resources to our website, hundreds and hundreds of articles and books and you know other – just lots of things. Podcasts like your own. Yeah. Uh, boy, if we don't have your podcast in our list of resources, uh, shame on us. Shame I'm, I'm, on you. Get out of here. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. You're off the show. <laughs> you oh, claim serious. to care about people. <laughs> <laughs> Bullshit. Uh, now, so, so Daryl. Before, before we go on, let me let me let the listeners know they can go to seculartherapy.org to find a therapist. And okay. We'll include yes. all of all of your organizations and all your work in the in the show, in the notes. show notes, so that'll be okay. a nice uh, way for people to find you. But yes, uh, it never hurts to to get that, and we'll also we'll also get you to say all the all the URLs and everything at the end of the yeah, interview. Right. I did want well, to. There, there, there's a few things around that. If I don't, I just want to make sure the information is accurate. People can find a therapist in their community. We have over 386 therapists registered and over 14,000 clients that have registered. Okay. But but we don't have a therapist in every town in the nation. So you may have to look for a distance counselor. Hmm. We have 204 of our 204 of our 386 uh, counselors do distance counseling of some kind. That means do what we're doing right now, talk on the phone or, or talk by Skype. Right. So you can get on our website and you can – Go to secretherapy.org, and you can search for a therapist in your town. If you don't find one, you can also search for a therapist that does distance counseling. So there's no need to go without help. You can do it, and you can find a distance counselor. That's amazing. That's awesome. So, Daryl, we, we great IT people that have done all this for free. We probably got a hundred thousand dollars worth of IT development from our IT people. Like, well, that's great. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's it's amazing. I we, mean, those kind of volunteers. Yeah. It's it's a community that's really banded together, isn't it? I mean, the the yeah. we, uh, you know, I I think a lot of us who have left religion and been through the trauma of 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 that have realized that we need to band together for uh for the for the other poor souls who are trying to get themselves right. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> so I the the other thing, you know you and I Daryl first met uh, when you were touring around talking about your book uh, 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 the God virus. Oh, uh-huh. I just okay. wanted that was like it's it's a tenth anniversary for that too, isn't it? It is that it's exactly the tenth anniversary of that one too. <laughs> See? See, I'm paying attention. I just what I I just thought I'd give you a chance to talk about that too because I thought I I think that's a really interesting uh f- just sort of a fascinating take on on religion in an, in the in America. Yeah, well the the whole reason it's the 10th anniversary of both is because when I published the book immediately I get got inundated when I published the God virus I got inundated with people saying help me and I couldn't I I just I couldn't help that many people. <laughs> right. So I just I Actually, the book w- book came out in like December of two thousand and eight, but the it didn't really make it to Amazon until January. But it, yeah, it's, so that's the tenth anniversary of of the God virus, and people. What I learned from that was people recognized in just the first three or four chapters of the book 
they recognized how the infection had uh, impacted their lives. And That's right, because because the premise of the book is basically that that sort of God belief is uh, it's it's like a, a viral infection, yeah, or a parasitic infection, um, you know, yeah, or in, you know any kind of pathological infection, yeah, that that controls takes control of a person's brain, and and I just li- I was just listening uh, to an interview the other day of an ex Jehovah's Witness, um, Evan uh, Lloyd. Who has a, a, a interesting podcast? And he was he was saying, and Jehovah's Witnesses do not have control of their mind. Uh, the organization controls their mind. And then he gave all these examples. I'm sitting here thinking, Lloyd, I hope you've read my book, but if you haven't, <laughs> you've come across the same idea. <laughs> yes, very much is. And same thing for Mormons, as you guys know. Yeah, the organization controls your mind. You you don't have you don't have control of your own mind. Well, that. That's a very depressing thought, uh, but I guess I guess you've 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 uh, at least created a whole bunch of organizations to help people get their own minds back. Well, yeah, right, and and you know I have a lot of readers reading the God Virus saying, "Wow, that book that help that book helped me get rid of disinfect myself." In fact, one of the running jokes with a lot of my readers is, "Hey, I finished your book. I'm disinfected now." <laughs> It's like going clear in Scientology. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there you go. Just send me all your money from now on. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, that you should be a... your response to I'm disinfected should be okay, pay up. <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a new angle. I hadn't thought about that. But I think I'll I'll start considering that, how you can ties to the Daryl Sea Org thing. There you go. <laughs> Well, well, Daryl, uh, it's been delightful having you on. I know that uh, we haven't had time to get to the thing that you have become most evangelical about, which is, of course, masturbation. But we'll uh, we'll have to have you on again and actually have some talks about sex and 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 religion and how religion has really poisoned uh, everybody's sexuality. Yeah, and right. continues to do so. Yeah, you know, what we should do. We should have you back on. On the anniversary of Boyd K. Packer's death, <laughs> uh, to, which is coming up, I think, to have a uh, uh, a frank discussion about the joys of, of masturbation. Oh, there you go. I'd love that. <laughs> okay. there, there is one other thing. Can I throw in one other thing about recovering from religion? Oh, I guess. <laughs> we have time? Oh, I yes. don't no, that. absolutely. Oh, I'm just kidding. Okay. okay. Talk so, to us. Th- as a part of our 10th anniversary, we have... We have initiated something we've never done before, and we think if it runs well, we're going to continue to do it. We're calling it an excursion, and it, it's like a retreat, only we don't like the word retreat because it has too many religious overtones to it. Mm. But we're doing an excursion in beautiful mountains in North Carolina in a gorgeous uh, center with log cabins and all in uh, September, Ooh. and it will be – it's a recovery retreat. You can come, and we're going to – have workshops on dealing with the trauma of, you know, religious indoctrination. We're going to have hikes in the mountains. I'm going to lead a hike. I'm a mountain climber. So we're going to go out there. I'm going to find out about the mountain. We're going to reconnect with our nature. And that's the theme of the excursion is reconnect with your nature. Because so much of religion disconnects us from our bodies, Mm. you know, uh, and disconnects us from nature, you know. God yeah. made that beautiful sun, sunrise. No, no, it's the way the rotation of the earth works. Right. So we're going to have an astronomer come out and give us some information. We're going to have a big telescope and let people look at the stars. We're, there's lots of activities in this. We're going to have three psychologists there that will be ready to just sit down and talk with anybody, you know, deal with any, you know, kind of do some advising about how to forward your journey out. And we're also uh, looking for donors that could help us subsidize the people that want to come because people are leaving religion. Oftentimes, aren't they're not the richest people in this world. Right. So we want to subsidize some of this. We we are going to have to charge because we don't have the funds to just make it free. But anyway, I'd just like to let your listeners know if they're interested in a recovery excursion, North Carolina in uh, September twenty first. I think it is. Where in North um, Carolina? It's about an. Uh, half hour outside of Asheville, up in the mountains. Brevard? Yeah. <laughs> nice. No, uh, I can't remember the name of the town. Right. It's, it's a beautiful, not the, beautiful area. It's gorgeous. Yeah. yeah, it's right up in a big stream coming right through. And, and all the uh, 
all the cabins have been handmade by a, a man and his son. Oh, wow. And, yeah, it's really a beautiful, just hand handcrafted everything. Big, big, you know, seats. Uh, I mean, uh, sleeps maybe 15 people per cabin and lots of separate rooms. Small mansions is what they are. That sounds it's like a gigantic bed and breakfast. For yeah, we're we're excited about it, and it's going to have so much opportunity to, for people to connect with other people. And well, that sounds that actually sounds really appealing. If you need three goofballs to come and uh, and provide uh, comic relief while you're up there and you demonstrate <laughs> masturbation, <laughs> yeah, <there you> <laughs> guys, <laughs> let us know. Well, we celebrate well, the gonna... nature of this six thousand year old Earth. Yes, <laughs> there you go. Yes. I'll, I'll, I'll be leaving a, a whole workshop on uh, on sexuality, reconnecting with your sexuality. Nobody's going to get naked or anything. So I'm sorry <laughs> to tell you that. But. Well, these two bozos are brothers. Ch- I don't think they'd want to. They <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Daryl Ray, uh, tell us once more where where folks can find uh, your orgs and 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 yeah. if if they're if they're seeking help recovering from their religion. Yeah, go to recoveringfromreligion dot org and hit the chat button right there on the front page. Uh, if you need a therapist, go to seculartherapy dot org and. Uh, Register. It's a very simple way to register, and it can be anonymous, too. We, we protect everybody's anonymity, and then you can search for a therapist uh, near you. If you're interested in uh, uh, the retreat, go on, uh, hit the excursion button, and it'll give you all the details there. And if you're interested in donating, which we always need funds to help support our mission, uh, go to the donate button and hit, hit the donate button for us. We'd, all, we'd really like some people to, to help us sponsor attendees so if you've yeah. got if you give us you know a few bucks to help sponsor attendees to, to get there that would be very very helpful for people who really do need some help in recovery a few bucks could change a life folks so if you can yeah. help let's do it yes indeed yeah. well uh daryl thank you so much for coming on we really appreciate yeah. chatting with My us pleasure. thanks for having me guys thank all you, right daryl. take care and uh, don't too, don't masturbate too much. It's addictive. <laughs> I've, I've heard well, that. Too much? What's too <laughs> now much? you tell me. <laughs> so, so far, I don't feel like I've crossed that threshold. I'm just, oh, well done. I'm just enjoying it. All right. Thanks, Daryl. All right. Bye-bye. Well, friends, that's it for this week's show. Hey, we'd love to hear from you. Send us an email, howto at howtoheretic.com. Or if you've ever insulted a sultan, tell us about it on our voicemail at 903 how to which is 903-884-6986. Also look for our album, Insult the Sultan, coming out soon. <laughs> and I'm right. also on Twitter at howtoheretic. Hey, thanks so much again to our patrons. And uh, thanks to our uh, little messiah, Cody Layton, for editing the show. And thank all of you for tuning in. Bye, friends. Farewell. Farewell.